You are a millionaire. Perhaps there is a a note of shock in this statement, and I'm sure this morning that you're skeptical. You're thinking probably that there's some catch in this, that there's some string attached to it. And from the viewpoint of some, even after I've concluded this morning, you're going to feel that there is a trick to it all. But never have I been any more sincere than when I say to you today, you are a millionaire. From very early times, Bible expositors noted the correspondence between the book of Joshua in the Old Testament and the epistle to the Ephesians in the New Testament, and vice versa. Many that have studied Ephesians go back to Joshua. Many who studied Joshua move on to Ephesians. What Joshua is to the Old Testament, the epistle to the Ephesians is to the New Testament, or let me put it like this. What the book of Joshua was to the children of Israel, the epistle to the Ephesians is to the believer in Christ today. So to properly evaluate, we need to interpret the spiritual truths of Ephesians in the light of the physical actions in the book of Joshua. Now God promised the children of Israel the land of Canaan. That is one of the great promises in the Word of God that's not said one time and it's not said twice, it's not repeated three times, nor four times, nor five, but I have a notion that you could find 100 passages where God says to the children of Israel, the land of Canaan is yours. He promised it to them. Uh, so much so that in time the land was no longer called the land of Canaan, it was called the promised land. And it was called the promised land because God had promised it to these people. Now, in this land, every material blessing was to be theirs. It was a land of physical possession. They were to have a full basket. They were to have bountiful crops. They were to have an abundance of good things, rain from heaven. They were to have green valleys filled with babbling brooks, waving grain, flocks, or on the mountains and the cattle on a thousand hills was to be theirs, and no good thing would God withhold from them. That was his promise to these people if they met certain conditions. Now, the believer today is blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And I take it that the word all does have a limitation. That is, all the spiritual blessings that God has for you and me are today in the heavenlies. And the heavenlies corresponds to the land of Canaan. Canaan is not heaven. It's not even a picture of heaven. Canaan is a picture of where the child of God's to live today, if you please, in the heavenlies. Now, these are some of the spiritual blessings that the child of God has. He's chosen of God. That's a a wonderful, uh, comforting truth. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Also, the child of God has an assurance from God. He has a redemption, a complete redemption. He is vouchsafed protection. He's given a sure salvation. He has available spiritual power and grace to meet every new situation and hope for the future. Can you think of anything that God has not promised to the child of God that's needful, that he has not put down in his word? He says, 
that he'll not withhold any good thing from those that are his own. Now, someone says, but these are spiritual blessings, and it's mighty hard to lay hold of them. And we are more or less interested in that which is tangible, that which is at our fingertips. We are still interested in the material. May I say, because these blessings are spiritual doesn't mean that they're any less real than the physical. fact of the matter is, I'm prepared to make this statement on the authority of the Word of God, that the spiritual blessings are more real than material blessings. For even riches can take wings and fly away, as the writer to the proverb says. But no one can rob you of assurance. No one can rob you of your salvation. No one can rob you of your spiritual blessings. And the Word of God says, 2 Corinthians 4, Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And I can illustrate that right here in this auditorium. Twelve years ago, there sat out here a group of people that are not here today. At that time, they seemed very tangible and physical and real, just like you are today. But after 12 years, they're gone. They've disappeared. They've been buried. But the message that I preached 12 years ago, I preached last Sunday, and the truths of that message which are not seen are still with us. The things which are not seen are more real than the things you're looking at always true. And may I say to you today that these are spiritual blessings are the ones that have been vouchsafed to the believer. Now, in order, I think, to properly evaluate these and to understand them, we need to go back to the book of Joshua and see the conditions that they had to meet in order to enter and appropriate and enjoy the land of Canaan, promised land. Now, here in these first nine verses that I read to you this morning, there are certain conditions that they had to meet before they could enjoy that land. Actually, there are three that are put down here in these first nine verses, and Before we consider them today, I think we ought to make sure to whom the Scripture is speaking. In this passage here, there's no way of misunderstanding. He's speaking to the children of Israel, no one else. God never said to a Hittite, he never said to an Amorite or a Moabite or an Edomite, or even, as Mr. Rosell said, to a Lectrite. He never said to any of them that they would enter the land and that they were promised anything in the land. But he did say to the children of Israel, the thing they had to do was to cross, though, the River Jordan. And the River Jordan is a picture to us of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May I say to you that the only way you and I can enter into the blessings is by and through the gospel. And that means that you and I are to lay hold of these blessings through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, for that's the way the children of Israel got in. Now, we need to be very careful about what the gospel is. There are many things being said today. I have here a statement that comes from the International Journal of Religious Education. It's written by an article written by Mr. William Kirkland. He's the alumni professor of Christian ethics in the McCormick Theological Seminary, Chicago, Illinois. Will you listen to just one sentence? Will you listen carefully? The gospel is God's demonstrated embodied love disclosing to young and old alike that we are truly his children and that through his mercy and grace it's possible for us to become the sons of God, 
that we actually are, no matter how badly we have blundered in the past in trying to do what we are not. I have mulled over that verse, uh, that uh, sentence, and to begin with, I can't make heads nor tails out of it. I do not know what he's talking about. I wish I could ask him. He is... Uh, writing in a journal of religious education. I would like to say it's neither religious nor education. It's a bum sentence. If I had written a sentence like that in college, I would have been given a zero. And to begin with, anyone knows you don't write a long sentence like that to begin with, and it ought to make sense. Will you listen to it again? Maybe you didn't get it. I haven't got it yet. The gospel is God's demonstrated, embodied love, disclosing to young and old alike that we're truly his children, and that through his mercy and grace it's possible for us to become the sons of God that we actually are, no matter how badly we have blundered in the past and trying to be what we are not. I must confess, friends, that to that I do not think is good education and certainly not Christian. The gospel is not quite that complicated, and it's not quite that disturbing, and it's not quite that, shall I say, bad English. It can be stated in succinct and clear English. Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel. Jesus died. He was buried. He was raised again. All of that according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Men's appropriation of that saves them. The children of Israel were taught that when they entered the land. They came first to Kadesh Barnea, couldn't enter in because of unbelief. They were sent around for a 40-year detour, to be exact, 38 years. 38 years later, a new generation came to the east bank of the Jordan River. The ark that speaks of Christ brought down to the water's edge. And the waters that were above, they banked up. The waters that below flowed on, and a dry land was open to them. To me, that's a greater miracle than the Red Sea. And they crossed over. The ark was put in the center. Where the ark was, twelve stones were taken out of that river, put on the west bank when they crossed over. And twelve stones taken from that bank and put back in the waters. Those waters speak of death, it's true, but not your death and my death. We sing today on Jordan's stormy banks I stand. You might, I don't. I can't sing anyway, but I wouldn't sing that song. To begin with, the Jordan River doesn't have stormy banks. Little old bitty creek that it is. It's not a big river. At flood stage, it, it spreads out and it's difficult to ford. In fact, you cannot afford it. The children of Israel crossed it at flood stage. It doesn't speak of our death. And where we cross over into Canaan, into heaven, it's not the picture. The picture, my beloved, is the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And those stones that were put back in that water, and as Joshua stood there and watched the water flow back, it spoke of death, the death of Christ. Those stones that were taken out and put on the other side speak of the resurrection of Christ. By his death and resurrection, they entered into the promised land. By the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we become sons of God. And not like this. Whatever he's saying, I'm confident it's wrong. We become sons of God the way Paul said. We become the sons of God. We become by regeneration by accepting and receiving Christ. And when we accept and receive Him, we become a son of God. We enter in, if you please, to Canaan. Now, the question is whether we are going to enjoy what's given to us today or whether we are not going to enjoy it. There are three conditions. May I give you these three conditions that were given to Joshua and we'll see they have application for us today. First of all, there is an action. Second, there is an attitude. Third, there is an authority. 
Will you notice these? First, there is an action. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses, an action, an attitude. Be strong and of a good courage, verse 6. And an authority, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Three things, if you please. First, an action. And there is that corresponding action for you and me, as we shall see. Now, will you notice what God said to Joshua? Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now, if you miss this before of the death, burial, and resurrection of crossing the Jordan River, you couldn't miss this, I'm sure. Moses is the representative of the law. He is the lawgiver. Moses was unable to lead them into the promised land. Moses, my servant, is dead. And my beloved, we are dead to the law. The law cannot lead us in. The law cannot save you. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. For by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Moses could not lead them in. Joshua means Jesus, and Jesus means Joshua, and it means Savior. Only Joshua could lead them in. Only a Savior could lead them in. The law cannot save you, but my beloved, today there is a Savior, and that Savior is the Lord Jesus, and until you and I look away from self. Look away from law. Look away from our own effort and energy. Look away from our sinful self and look to the Savior. Not until then do we become a child of God. So, God reminded Joshua at the very beginning, Moses, my servant, is dead. Well, didn't Joshua know it? Yes, he'd already written it in verse 1, but God reminded him that Moses will not do any of the leading because he's dead. Now will you notice, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. And it's a vast land. It covered the land of the Hittites, which was the Hittites, a nation that they've only found out in the past 25 years very much about them. They were a great uh, Hamitic people that at one time dominated that entire land of Asia Minor, a strong people. God says, I've given you the land of the Hittites. I've given you all the way to the Euphrates River, all the way from the land of Egypt. This whole land is yours. I've given it to you. But Joshua, you are going to have to walk up and down in that land. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that's yours. I promised it to Abraham. I reaffirmed it to Isaac. I reiterated it to Jacob. And again and again I told Moses that the land is yours. Joshua, I told you it's yours. But you've got to walk on it before it's yours. Every place that the sole of your foot shall walk upon, that's yours. There is a doctor down in San Diego who arranges his trip, so he tells me every day at noon from one hospital to another to hear the high noon broadcast. He writes me all oh, three or four times a year a very lengthy letter. And he always supplies me with some choice stories. And he sent me this one this week. It's a story about a a Negro boy that entered an integrated school in Tennessee. And he went out for track. 
And there came the important track meet of the year. And this boy got off to a bad start in the race, and he was falling way behind. But along about middle ways of the race, he began to improve and move up front. And when they finished, well, he broke the tape first, and he won. The coach went over to him and said to him, how did you do it? He said, I prayed. He said, what did you pray? Well, he says, when I, I saw us getting behind, I said to the Lord, we're not going to rent, win this race unless you help me. And if you will pick them up, I'll put them down. <laughs> and he said, the Lord picked them up, and I put them down, and that's the way we won the race. May I say to you, that's the way that you and I are going to lay hold of our spiritual possessions. Now, God will pick them up. You've got to put them down. Every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, that's yours. You will have to do that. My beloved, today there are many believers. I think they're saved. They say they are. They say they've trusted Christ. They apparently got across the Jordan River, but they're hanging on to the bank, ready to slip back in any minute. They know nothing about the glories and the beauties and the joys and how to enjoy the land of Canaan. Actually, the children of Israel, some of them never did get very far, never got very much of the land. It was theirs, but they never enjoyed it. May I use a very homely illustration and a personal one, if you don't mind. When I was a boy, around 12 to 14, we lived in southern Oklahoma in a little town you've never heard of. The name of it is Springer. It's just barely on the map. When they moved the highway, the little town is smart. They moved the two stores up on the highway, and they're still in existence. It's a little town. It's right at the foot of the Arbuckle Mountains. And beginning right out of town was the Sibley Ranch of several thousand acres. Mr. Sibley, so the doctor said, had ulcers. He couldn't ride horseback, and he'd never ridden over in his ranch. He had the first automobile I've ever seen, and that thing could never made it up the hill, over the first hill of the Arbuckle Mountains into the ranch. And this poor man, although he had the title deed to it, he never enjoyed it, but there are half a dozen of us boys between 12 and 14. We knew that ranch. We knew every foot of it. We knew on the buzzard, for that was the name of the little creek that ran through it, where the best swimming hole was. It came up to here. We knew where you could fish. You could catch catfish and perch. We knew at the beginning of the quail season the very hollow that the quail were in. We knew where you could get rabbits, the very pasture that the rabbits were in. And in the fall of the year, we knew where every red heart tree was, where the persimmon trees were, and where the pecans were. And we thrashed the pecan trees. We shook the persimmon trees. And we picked the red heart. Mr. Sibley couldn't eat them. He had ulcers. We were growing boys. And we had fried rabbit. We had stewed squirrel. And we ate persimmons and red haws and pecans. He had title deed, but he never did enjoy the ranch. But I know six boys that for two years that on every weekend and during the vacation season and in every holiday, we roam that ranch of several thousand acres. When I go back to Dallas of a fall, it's been my custom to take the Texas chief up to Chicago for meetings in that area. And late in the afternoon, you go through the Arbuckle Mountains up the Canadian as it snakes up there. I always go to the vestibule, open the door, and... A couple of the Pullman conductors have got acquainted with me. One of them said, while you lived in Springer, I lived in Berwyn. 
And he said, I too roam through those hills. And, well, what nostalgia. To stand there in the vestibule and smell those, the odors of the woods as that train snakes slowly up by the side of the Canadian. May I say to you today, there are a lot of believers like Mr. Sibley. I think they must have spiritual ulcers. They don't enjoy being a Christian. They've never entered in. They've never laid hold of anything. They're just dyspeptic. They may be saved. Maybe they're saved. But my beloved, may I say to you today, especially on the threshold of a new year, that over those spiritual mountains today, they are filled with a spiritual abundance for you. If you just go over and get them and appropriate them, you say, what's over there? Well, let me choose at random just one or two things today that are there. May I say to you, there's security. Everybody's looking for security today, and the security over those mountains in that valley for you, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Security is there. Say that's not all that's there. There's peace in that valley in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He made peace for the blood of his cross and we've been redeemed. And no longer is God on the war path against man. And today, God has his arms outstretched and he says, I've made peace with this world. And today the sinner can come to me. The cold war is over. And you can come into a warm relationship with God. Oh, may I say there are other blessings there. There's joy on those hills which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Earnest of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us as earnest and only the Holy Spirit can produce joy. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And then, my beloved, there's something else over there. Hope. And this world's about lost its hope today, hasn't it? that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. And what a glorious day is ahead for the child of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I've never had a fulfillment yet of my life, have you? I've never been the man I've wanted to be. I've never preached a sermon here that I wanted to preach. Always said after it, I wish I could have done it better. Always room for improvement. But one of these days, he's going to gather together all things in him. And when I stand in his presence, I will have reached the fulfillment of life. My friend, that's something to look forward to. And the world's lost that. Over in France, there's a young lady. I call her a young lady. She's become so famous that you don't even need to pronounce her name. You just give her initial, E.B. Everybody knows who you're talking about. Twenty-six years of age, retiring from the movies, attempted to commit suicide. Why? I tried and tasted everything in life, and it's bittersweet. And my beloved, this morning, she's tried everything. You can't mention anything that she hasn't tried in the way of sin. She says today, not worth it. No hope, no future. Oh, my beloved, over that second hill, if you just only go over and get it, there's a hope for you today. When you stand in his presence. These are some of the wonderful things. Somebody says, how can I get it? 
By faith, we read, they crossed the Red Sea. By faith, they entered the Promised Land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. You'll never get it except by faith, I can assure you that. And today, we're told to move on in. And if we move on in, they are ours. Here's what we're told to do. Now, a great many people think the epistle to the Ephesians is way up yonder in the heavenlies. May I say it's not up in the heavenlies. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is no great victory parade. This is a walk in humility down here. And if you and I are willing to walk into the promised land that he has for us, walk in humbleness, leaning upon the Holy Spirit of God, and by faith these things become ours today. Oh, this year, that you might live like a millionaire, because you are a millionaire. I move on quickly. An attitude. Will you notice? In verse 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Moses was a great leader. Moses was dead. Many a time this young minister of Moses, Joshua, so Moses step out and act for God, and that young man said, Oh, I wonder if I'd ever be able to do that. I wonder if I could do that. And now God says to him, As I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you, Joshua. And Joshua was just an ordinary man, by the way, a very ordinary man. I'm sure that many of you saw the football game last Monday, either in the Rose Bowl or by TV. I do know this, that 100,000 people there, plus probably a larger TV audience, saw Bob Floret of Washington of the Huskies. They saw him play a brilliant game. And they played the game too, but they played it by proxy. They stood on the sideline. They looked in at a TV, and when they saw him running, they probably stood up, and maybe they got a little thrill out of it. But they didn't know what it was to give the signals, carry the ball, and go over for a touchdown. Only Bob knew that. The rest of them, they played it by proxy. My beloved, how many today are living the Christian life by proxy? Sit on the sideline. They listen to thrilling testimonies. They read biographies. They're substitute saints today. They're playing on the bench on the sidelines of life. They've never gotten in. God says to Joshua, an ordinary man, says, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. And then God says this to him, listen, be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. Verse 9, be strong strong and of a good courage. You see, God's improving his attitude. A great many today have read about David, but it means nothing. A great many have read about Elijah, but it means nothing. A great many Christians today read about John the Baptist, means nothing. This is a day of compromise. This is a day of Christian cowards. Afraid to stand up against the world. Afraid to stand for God today. Afraid to stand against the tide. A 
young people afraid to be different. Why, they wouldn't be called a square for anything in the world. I have been thrilled this week as I have read letter after letter from humble believers saying, Oh, I am a coward. I'm so weak. By his grace this year, I'm going to live for him. Oh, God's going to help a lot of folks this year, I know. Have you ever noted this man, Simon Peter? And if there ever was a coward, Simon Peter was a coward. That poor fellow let a little wisp of a girl make him deny his Lord. I have a notion that as long as he lived, he went off periodically back of the barn and kicked himself for being such a coward and doing that thing and have it written eternally in the Word of God. But there came a day filled by the Holy Spirit of God going forth no longer in the power of Simon Peter with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I read this in Acts 4.13 now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. This man Simon Peter will no longer deny and say, I don't know him. Now man will know that he belongs to Jesus. He'll take a stand. And I think the most wonderful thing said about that early church is when persecution broke and they went to prayer. And now, here's the prayer. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servant that with servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They did not ask that the persecution cease. They just said, give us boldness to stand for God. That's the reason they enjoyed their salvation, though, because they had that attitude, be strong and courageous. And it's in the epistle to the Ephesians, we're told, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And Paul wrote at the same time another prison epistle in which he said, I can do all things in Christ who strengtheneth me. And again he wrote, When I am weak, then am I strong. Oh, my friend today, if we only take that attitude, that attitude that he wants to give us today, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and to stand for him regardless today of the price. Briefly, I come to the last. There is an action to be performed. There is an attitude to be assumed. There is an authority to be recognized. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest Observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success and authority. Now, something new has been added here. I do not know, unless you've read the Pentateuch and have come to the book of, of Joshua, whether you would note it or not. Did you know that when you are reading the Pentateuch about men like Noah, and men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they had no written word at all. It's not until you come to Joshua was there anything written. Moses had written a Pentateuch, and that's the one thing he left. Now God says to Joshua, Joshua, I'll not always be appearing to you in a vision. I'll not always be speaking to you as I did to Moses in that method. But I want you to know that the Word of God that you have now, the Pentateuch, is your authority. We are living in a day when some conservative man, under the influence of Karl Barth of Switzerland, are saying, we can no longer hold to the plenary verbal inspiration of the Scriptures, and they're using the same old cliché that slays so many younger men. It's very effective. If you do hold to it, you will not be a scholar. Well, I've passed the stage where I aspire 
to those things. And I want to say to you today, I believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible. I believe that this is God's Word. I think it's the only miracle that God has in this world today. It's the Word of God. And these men today that are saying now what we're to do is not to put the Word above Jesus. You will not know anything about Jesus except through the Word. Here's where you find out about Him. This is the miracle of God in the world today is the Word of God. I believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. It's a potent weapon, I know, against those who have ambitions to become scholars, to tell them they can't be a scholar if they believe in the plenary verbal. I say you can. The greatest scholars of the past have. This book is the only authority that we have today. Now, there are three things here that God said to Joshua that they must do, and I believe that today we must do it if we're to enjoy our possessions. He said, first, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You see, there was only one copy in existence then. Everybody didn't carry a Schofield Bible under their arm in those days. Only one copy in existence. And how did the people know it? They memorized it. There were many in the, of the children of Israel at the time of the Lord Jesus that could quote the Old Testament verbatim. Why, among the Greeks, there were many that could quote both the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer. Boy, when I look at that in the Greek, I want to say I have great respect for those shepherds and ordinary folk that could quote the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I have great respect for the common man in Israel that could quote the entire Old Testament, and they could do it. He says to them, first, let not this word depart out of thy mouth. You're to know it. God today, in this enlightened age in which we live, when everybody can have a Bible, and especially a Schofield Bible, and I think you ought to have one. I always mention that when I hear somebody run it down. I heard somebody run it down this past week, so I recommend it again. <laughs> everybody ought to carry a Bible, but I'm afraid that we've got a lot of folk today carrying a Schofield Bible under their arm, and that's as high up as it gets. It's never even gotten up around the, the uh, cranium. It's, uh, it's not in the cerebellum at all, and it's not in the medulla oblongata. We're to know it. God will not, nor can he bless us spiritually if we are ignorant of the Word of God. We're to know it first. Second, he says, second, you're to meditate therein. Meditate therein day and night. Now, meditation is a very interesting word. You find it again in the first psalm. Blessed is the man, walketh not in the counsel, standeth nor sitteth. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. There's the word again. In the Hebrew, it's a very picturesque word. It's a picture of a cow chewing her cud. cow goes out in the morning, in the cool of the morning, the grass covered with dew, and she goes around and nips all the grass, fills up one stomach. You know, she has, an, she always carries an extra. She fills up one, and then in the, when it gets hot in the day, she goes up in the cool of the tree and sits down and transfers it from one stomach to the other by bringing it back and meditating over it. She chews the cud. She chews it all over again. I'm sure we've lost that art today of studying the Word of God, meditating upon the Word of God. I appreciated all the letters, how wonderful they are. One was, one man says, when I got home, I did not write you a letter because I didn't want to do it under the emotion. I got my Bible. And a couple days later, I began to study the Word of God and see if I still had the desire to rededicate my life to God. And he says, I did. The Word of God did it. May I say to you, my beloved, we're to meditate in the Word of God. The third thing, 
He says here, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. Observe to do it. And that, my friend, means to obey it. Now, here is something that's about as prosaic and as much of a back number as anything I can think of today, but it happens to be in the Word of God. You talk about old-fashioned. Listen to this. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Isn't that old-fashioned? But may I say to you today, there is no blessing apart from obedience to the Word of God. This idea today that Christians, and one of the reasons they're frustrated today, and one of the reasons today they're not happy and enjoying the Christian life, they are not obeying the book. have to obey the book. And listen to this. He says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Why? Not with eye service as man pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. He says the reason you'd obey those that are over you is because you want to be obedient to Christ and you can't be a happy Christian and be disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Never enter these great spiritual blessings. No spiritual blessings are ours apart from the Word of God. And Paul concludes this great epistle to the Ephesians by saying, last of all, when you put on the whole armor, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. One lady wrote, I think almost facetiously, and said, I didn't know the meaning last Sunday of the, of the sword that you used to break the pitcher. I didn't see the meaning in it. May I say, I hope you see it now. The sword is the Word of God. It's the Word of God, my friend, that can break. It's the Word of God that can not only break hard hearts, it's the Word of God today, that can be the balm of Gilead upon broken hearts also. You don't have to prove the Word of God today. You just need to use it. Children of Israel didn't have to fight at Jericho. They just obeyed God. Today they're testing atomic bombs. That's one of the big problems for the future. But there's one thing sure, nobody today is arguing about the potency of the atom bomb. You just use it. You just test it. And then you don't argue about whether it's potent or not. Most of those today who question the Word of God are in theological seminaries and schools where they deal with theory and not with fact where they're living a sheltered life. I have been on Hope Street at 6th in downtown Los Angeles for 12 years. I've spent 25 years in the ministry, and I have had to fight the temptation several times of an attractive offer to go and teach in a school. It's so nice to crawl over into a hole and get away from it all today and teach. But I want to tell you, I want to stay out on the arena of life today and see the sword of the Spirit in action. And I've seen it in action. I have here, I trust you'll forgive me, we've been attempting to use the sword and I use it as badly as Simon Peter used it against that soldier at the rest of Jesus. But listen to this. I went to church regularly in the South but I was definitely not a saved person until you showed me the light. May I say, the Word of God works today. And then here is a letter that thrilled me a great deal from a a very fine man. I gladly rededicate myself to him who gave himself for me and loved me even when I didn't know him or love him. Through God using you in the high noon Bible class, I've been growing in grace and in the knowledge of him. And then, 12 years ago, we were in another church and recorded the message and played it after lunch. You found us at the wine press. Six years ago, we were in your church and you led us to the water hole, scared but anxious. Sunday morning, the light broke through like a flash, and I could see the answer to our prayers and problems. This pitcher needs to be broken 
and I'm afraid to have it so. Oh, my friend, the Word of God is the sower of the Spirit. And the Word of God today will still work. Oh, to enter in by faith with the sower of the Spirit. And lay hold for the blessings that God has fought us. Last Sunday morning, a man went out this door, stopped, and he said, You don't know me. And I said, Yes, I've met you somewhere. He said, Yes, in San Diego. He said, It must have been ten years ago. But I started listening to the high noon broadcast because another fellow brought down to the harbor in San Diego a radio, and I had to listen. And he says, You know, I used to sit there and call you a three-letter word. I called you everything under the sun. But he says, I kept listening. And one day, the Word of God entered my heart. Oh, my friend today, this is the only weapon we have. But you can enter in today. Oh, there are giants in the land. But you can enter in with the Word of God. You're a millionaire. Why live like you're on skid row? Why live like a pauper? Why live like you're bankrupt? When God says, enter in. And every place that the foot of your sole of your foot will step on, it's yours. I'll give it to you. Be strong and of good courage. And don't think you can disobey this book and receive any spiritual blessings, you know by experience you cannot obey the book. Shall we pray? As we come this morning to the conclusion of this service, I want to pause just this moment. And again today, I would be tempted to ask for those who are willing to enter in to enter in, but I don't do that and I won't do it. But I would like to say to you today, if you come in here and you haven't even crossed over Jordan, and I say you're in the wilderness today, lost, and lost your way, and you know there's no satisfaction in the wilderness, you know today those are dried up holes out there that so many people gather around today. They won't satisfy you. But this morning, just simply by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, just receiving Him, the one who went down into the waters of death, He came up out in resurrection. He's opened up a way for you today to the riches of His grace. And He says, enter in by faith. And it's for you today. It's for you today. And don't let those about you who profess to be Christians discourage you or disappoint you or cause you to turn away because they may be just holding on to the bank of Jordan this morning. I guess they're over. But the floodwaters have come down, and it's all they can do to hold on. And God wants them out yonder, walking up and down, laying hold of spiritual possession. But you, this morning, need to receive Him. Between you and Him. With heads bowed. I'm wondering this morning how many of you here as we enter in this new year, you'd like to say, Preacher, pray for me because by faith, I need to enter in. I need to enter in today. Pray for me that I might see him as my Savior and trust him today.